So I'm going to talk about the work that I do, and in particular, I'm going to talk about an experiment that I've worked on in the past called Spider. And for those of you who are here for the pre-talk entertainment, those were time-lapse videos of the Spider experiment being put together in McMurdo Station, Antarctica, and then the launch of the Spider uh, telescope from the station. So I'll have more videos of that later on. Um, and then this title slide is a view of the stratosphere from the Spider payload. Okay. Um, so I am a cosmologist, and I'll tell you, I'll start off by telling you what I do for a living. Um, so as cosmologists, the, th the questions that we try to answer are basically studying the universe as a whole. So we are interested in some of the big questions, such as how and when did the universe begin? Um, what is the fate of the universe? How is it going to end up? And what is the universe made of on its biggest scales? And um, amazingly, we have reached the point in science where we can answer these questions in quantitative ways by building specialized telescopes, which is really a remarkable thing. And these questions are quite deep and profound, and they have been asked by mankind as long as humans have, have existed. Um, so to illustrate that, um, this wonderful engraving is, uh, the, this is the Flammarion engraving from the late uh, 1800s. And this shows an artist's depiction of what uh, a cosmologist back then might have been doing. And so I'm not sure what exactly the artist had in mind when he or she made this engraving, um, but it is very similar in spirit to what we do today as modern cosmologists. So this, this person is staring out you know, into the beyond, into the void, and trying to see what lies out there in the universe. And what lies out there looks very different from what we are familiar with in our day-to-day -day existence. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about um, how cosmology became a science. Um, and cosmology really um, emerged as a science in the 1900s um, with two major discoveries. So I'll start off with the first one. Uh, the first one was from Edwin Hubble, who's this fellow sitting at the telescope at Mount Wilson. And what Hubble was doing was observing distant galaxies and watching their behavior. And he noticed a peculiar thing, which is that on average, all the galaxies seem to be moving away from us, which is kind of strange. And he found one more peculiar thing, which is this equation. I promise it is the only math that is in my entire talk for tonight, but it's a simple equation. So, <laughs> so bear with me, I'll explain what it means. Um, this equation encapsulates the idea that when he observed the galaxies, he found that ones that were farther away from us tended to be receding from us at a faster rate than ones that are closer to us. And so that is encapsulated in this tiny little neat equation. So this is known as the Hubble Law, named after him. And the interpretation of these observations is that the universe is expanding right now and that all points are moving away from each other. So space-time it's, uh, um, itself is getting bigger um, with time. And so if that's what's happening right now, you can run that picture backwards in time and imagine that at early times, the universe used to be a more compact and more dense place. And so this was a really important discovery made in the 1920s by Hubble, and it's one of the foundations of modern cosmology. So that's discovery number one. I'm going to talk about discovery number two now. So fast forward to 1964. These two fellows, Penzias and Wilson, were working at Bell Labs in New Jersey, and they were working with this giant antenna that's shown in the background of this photograph. Now, now these guys were making measurements of the sky, and they found what seemed to be a noise in their antenna that they couldn't get rid of. Um, at first, they thought it was pigeon droppings, and so they tried cleaning out their instrument, and they tried everything that they could possibly do to get rid of this supposed noise, and they couldn't get rid of it. And so they talked to some colleagues to figure out what this could possibly be, and it turns out that um, this is a uniform glow that's present across the entire sky, and what they had measured was the leftover heat from the Big Bang. Okay. So this was a really significant discovery. Um, they received the 1978 Nobel Prize for this. And, um, and so this, this afterglow of the Big Bang is called the Cosmic Microwave Background, or CMB. And that's an acronym that I'm going to be using throughout this talk, so that's, that's what it stands for. Now the microwave background, like I mentioned, is kind of the remnant heat that's left over from you know, some massive hot thermal event in the beginning of the universe. And it's not very much heat, so it actually corresponds to only three degrees above absolute zero, which is not really what you would think of as warm. But you can actually measure this. If you point your telescope at the sky, you will see it glow at three degrees above absolute zero in any direction that you look. Okay, so once again, if we, um, if we take this picture and run it backwards in time, um, because this is leftover heat that's um, remaining from some earlier period, we can guess that the universe used to be a hot and dense place. So putting this discovery together with Hubble's um, discovery, um, we can make that, we can put that picture together. 
So those are the two discoveries that really underpin modern cosmology. There have been a lot more observations and measurements since then, and this is our current picture of, or our current understanding of the history of the universe um, with all the data that we have in hand. So focus on the bottom picture for now. This is just an illustration of the lifetime of the universe. So it started with a large explosion on the left-hand side, so that's the Big Bang. Um, we think the universe was created from a single point, and it was a very hot and dense place in the beginning. And as the universe has evolved, it's been expanding and cooling off, and then we live down here 14 billion years down the line. So there are a number of milestones along the uh, evolution of the universe, and the one that I'm going to focus on is the CMB, or the microwave background, and that was created at 400,000 years after the Big Bang, which sounds like a lot, but if you compare that to 14 billion years, 400,000 years is actually a drop in the bucket, and I'll get back to that a little bit later. So that light was created then, and then as the universe continued cooling and expanding, um, we started to see structures form, the first stars turned on, first galaxies formed, and finally um, we have all of the stars and structure that we see today in the present universe. So it's a little bit hard to um, wrap your head around 14 billion years of evolution, and so I'm going to draw some analogies. Um, so I'm going to take the, the lifetime of the universe and compress it into a human's lifetime and draw analogies between the various milestones and milestones in a human's lifetime. So this creation of the microwave background after the Big Bang, um, it was 400,000 years after the Big Bang, and that corresponds to actually the first several minutes of a human's lifetime. So in other words, when we measure the microwave background, we are looking at the universe as it was in its infancy, which is really kind of amazing. So if we move forward to um, later milestones in the universe's history, um, when the first structures started to form, so collapsing under gravity, that corresponds to the first few years of a human's life, so kind of when you're a toddler. And then by the time you get to galaxies and things that look familiar to us today, that corresponds to retirement age. So, so by looking at all these different um, slices of the universe's history, we can piece together a complete picture of its evolution. Um, but in particular, the microwave background is really special um, because it's like looking at a child, childhood photograph of the universe and getting that early information out. Okay, so the microwave background is, has become so important for cosmology that it's actually featured in popular culture. For those of you who are familiar with the website xkcd.com, you can go over there and buy a, a shirt where you can proudly display the spectrum of the microwave background front and center. Um, and this is actually, I found out this is one of my colleagues who was modeling the shirt on their website. And there's, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a rather forceful assertion that science works really well. And, and that's because, yes, the microwave background has been such an important tool for cosmology. Okay, so I'm going to talk about how we make measurements of the microwave background, um, but before I get to that, I want to take a brief aside and talk about how astronomers represent data on the sky and how we make maps of that. So um, this map in the upper left-hand corner is something that everyone is familiar with. It's a map of the Earth. And when we map out the sky as astronomers, um, we also map out a spherical surface. So if we were to look at the sky on everywhere on Earth, from everywhere on Earth, then we would also get a sphere. So in order to um, create this picture of the Earth, um, what the, I don't know, the map maker has done has, has taken the globe and unwrapped it, essentially, into an oval. And so when we show pictures of the sky as astronomers, we do the same thing, because we have a sphere of information where we have um, information about the sky, and we just unwrap it into an oval as well. Um, and then we orient it so that the Milky Way runs along the center of this. So the Milky Way is now our equator for our maps. Now, this map down here is an actual map of the microwave sky taken by the Planck satellite. Now, what you mostly see is this haze in the front, and that's from our Milky Way galaxy because, um, because the sky is complicated, and so there's stuff in the way when you try to observe. And so there's all this dust in the way from our own galaxy. And um, what I'm going to focus on in the next slide is actually we're interested in looking at this modeled structure that you can just barely see the blue stuff. Um, and that is, um, that is the signal in the microwave background that we're looking for. So we kind of have to peel off all of this emission from the, from the Milky Way and look through that and get rid of it. So if you do some data processing and you subtract off this signal, then what you get is this picture. 
So this is now the, the Milky Way has been lifted off, and I've enhanced the contrast so that you, get, you see more of the modeled structure. And now this is not actually the three Kelvin uniform background I mentioned, um, but this is actually tiny hot and cold spots on top of that. And for those of you who are astute, if you look at the scale on this thing, you'll notice that these temperature fluctuations are really, really small. These are 500 microkelvin compared to three Kelvin as the uniform background. And so, um, but this is real data. So um, it's not noise in the instrument. If you look at this part of the sky, it really is legit hot, hotter there than you know, this cold spot here. Now, why this is important is because, um, like I said, this is a photo of the universe in its infancy. And the hot and cold spots that you see here correspond to regions of the universe that were slightly over or under dense in the early universe. And so, if you run that picture forward, the, the areas that were slightly over dense start collapsing under gravity, and then they create all the structure that we see today. So another way of thinking about this picture is that every star or every galaxy that you see um, collapsed gravitationally at some point, and it came from one of the over dense areas in this picture. And so this right here is a childhood photograph of the universe, um, and that gave birth to all of the structure that we see today. Now, when um, the COBE telescope was the first experiment to measure these fluctuations, and they won a Nobel Prize for that discovery as well, it was hailed by Stephen Hawking as the discovery of the century, if not of all time, um, because this has been so significant for cosmology studies. So, unfortunately, I don't have time to get into all of the wonderful stuff that has come out of this measurement, um, because that would be a whole other two or three talks. Um, but I'm going to forge ahead and talk about what current experiments are doing right now, um, which is, so you notice in this picture, I've been focusing on the temperature uh, of the um, microwave background, um, but it actually contains more information, and that is that the microwave background is also polarized. Um, so as a reminder, um, light is an electromagnetic wave. So you can imagine standing with a friend and stretching a jump rope between you two. And if you wiggle the jump rope up and down, you create a wave. And so light is very similar to that. It's also a wiggling of some sort in the electromagnetic field. Um, and now you know that if you send a wave down to your friend on the jump rope, you can choose a direction for it. So you can wiggle the jump rope up and down, or you can wiggle it back and forth. And that direction of the wiggling is called polarization. And so that's what's shown in this cartoon in the top of the slide. Okay. And so telescopes are trying to measure this polarization of the microwave background right now. And that's what's shown in the bottom picture here. So the colorful splotches correspond to hot and cold spots. So this is kind of a zoom of the previous picture that I showed. But you'll see that now there are little lines drawn on top of it. And each one of these little black lines represents the average direction of polarization or the average wiggling direction of light in that particular point on the sky. And you'll notice there are many lines. So if you stare over here, the, the light wiggles back and forth horizontally. But if you stare over here, it's wiggling up and down vertically instead. So you can build up this information over the entire sky. And that's what telescopes um, like SPIDER, as I'll explain later, are trying to do right now. Um, so you might be asking yourself, why bother? You know, why, why do we want to make these measurements? Um, because um, we've just added a bunch of lines to our picture, right? So what's the big deal? And the answer is that there is a lot of rich physics hidden in the patterns of the polarization. Um, so it turns out that if you have a picture like this with a bunch of lines drawn, you can split that up into two distinct patterns. Um, and these are mathematical terms. And I'm, like, I promise there's no more equations, so I'm not going to show you the math behind it. But I'm going to give you kind of an intuitive feel for what they are. So one is called an E-mode pattern. Don't worry about the E part. The most important thing to know about this pattern is that it doesn't have any sense of rotation. So these are two classic E-mode patterns where one looks like um, spokes on a wheel and the other one looks like the rim of a wheel. And you can't say that one is counterclockwise or clockwise. Right? So there's no sense of rotation in these. And that is one particular geometric pattern that we can fish out of this more complicated thing. The other pattern is called a B-mode pattern, so that's shown on the bottom. And you can see that these, kind of, these patterns are distinct from the upper ones because they have a sense of either clockwise or counterclockwise uh, rotation or handedness in these patterns. So there's kind of a swirling motion in these patterns that you can pick out. Um, like I said, there is math behind all of this, but I don't want to bog you down with equations. Um, so this is kind of a qualitative feel for how we can split up these patterns. 
So, okay, so you might be asking yourself now, like, why, why bother doing that, right? Because you have a picture, now you split it up. Um, and the reason is because there are different um, physical principles underlying each of these patterns. So let's start with E. So this pattern up here is actually something that we expect to be there, um, just from basic physics processes in the microwave background. And it turns out that a lot of experiments have measured this signal already, and it's in near perfect agreement with our theory. So that's actually awesome. So, so that's, that's all good. We seem to be able to do basic physics. Um, now, what about the B mode pattern? Well, it turns out that um, conventional physics for just the microwave background itself doesn't predict anything here. So in, um, we shouldn't really expect to see anything here um, except if there is new physics. And so that's the part where everyone is very excited and searching for this signal. And the new physics in particular is um, gravitational waves from the early universe. Um, so we think that the universe may have gone through a growth spurt of some sort called inflation right after Big Bang. And during that growth spurt, it released a whole bunch of gravitational waves into the universe that are still rattling around today. And if they are there, then they will leave this tiny swirling imprint on the polarization of the microwave background. And if we can measure that, then that's really incredible because then we will be able to see all the way back to the first moments right after the Big Bang, 10 to the minus 34 seconds. And then wouldn't that be awesome? Go claim your Nobel Prize and go have a good day. So. So that's great. So that's why a lot of people, including Spider, are trying to search for this signal. And so that's awesome. There's one catch, is that this is really hard to measure. So I'm going to show you a simulation. Um, this is a, a simulated picture of the microwave background where their colors represent the, whole, the hot and cold spots again. And you can see the lines on there representing the polarization directions. In this particular picture, there are no gravitational waves. So this is pure E-mode pattern in here. What I'm going to do in the next slide is turn on a small, actually, it's actually a large amount of gravitational waves, and we're going to inject a little bit of swirling into this pattern. Okay? So keep your eyes focused on this and ready for it. So that is the difference when we inject gravitational waves on, off, on, off, on, off. And probably what you're noticing is the difference in colors, but remember that that's the difference in temperature, and so we are really interested in measuring the twitching of the black lines between this picture and this picture. So, yeah, in, in this picture, therein lies the Nobel Prize. But <laughs> you can see that's a little bit hard to find. And I like showing this. Um, these, these pictures are actually very old. They're from my PhD advisor from over a decade ago. Um, but these are what he showed me to get me into the business because I thought, wow, this, this looks like a really hard problem. It should be really fun. Um, what he didn't tell me at the time is that this is actually, um, this effect in these pictures is about 10 times exaggerated over the best limits that the experiments have right now. So what we're trying to do is actually 10 times harder than what you see in this picture. Um, but that's okay. That makes it even more fun. Right, so that is the science goal of what we're trying to achieve. And now I'm going to talk, uh, talk to you about how we catch a microwave and how we actually make these measurements. Um, so as, as suggested, the cosmic microwave background is light in the microwave uh, wavelength regime. And uh, so in order to measure these uh, microwaves, we have to build a telescope that can actually see them. Um, so how do we do that? All right, so this, this is a bit of a b busy picture, but just focus on the top part for now. What this picture shows is what light gets through our atmosphere at Earth. So on the horizontal axis is wavelength. So going from, uh, must be, ooh, I think some of this got cut off. So yeah, it's very short wavelengths over here and very long wavelengths over here. So this is where radio lives. This is where gamma and X-ray live over here. And you can see this rainbow is where optical lives. Kind of that, That's the place that we're most familiar with. Now, the vertical axis, or the height of the line, represents how much stuff gets through our atmosphere. Um, so, or actually, how much stuff gets blocked. Sorry, I said that backwards. So you can see that um, over here, where you have that rainbow stripe, the line falls to something pretty low, which means that most of the light gets through our atmosphere, and that's why we can see stars at night. So that's good, because light gets through. Um, over here on this side, you can see that for X-rays and gamma rays, um, the atmosphere blocks most of that. So that's also good, because then we don't get roasted by that. Um, over here, uh, long wavelengths, you can see those also get blocked. Um, there's a wonderful window over here where the line falls to zero, and that's where a lot of stuff gets through, and that's all on the radio. And so that's why experiments like the Square Kilometer Array, um, this marvelous new radio telescope array that's being constructed, um, they live right here on Earth in South Africa, um, because we have this really clean window to see all the radio waves coming from outer space. So 
Microwaves are a little bit more complicated. They live in this red box over here. And you can see that the line is, it's not completely blocked, but it's also not completely um, transparent either. So that makes life complicated. And the reason for the complication is because of water vapor in the atmosphere. So the moral of the story is that if we want to have a good, clean view of the sky, we need to send our microwave telescopes to places that are higher and drier. And so there are favorite places for our telescopes to operate from. So Antarctica is my favorite, and I'm going to talk about that in the rest of the talk. Um, Chile is also a favorite place. Um, lots of telescopes sprinkled up there. Um, Hawaii, outer space, if you have the money for it. So all of these places are a great place to do microwave cosmology. All right, so as promised, I'm going to focus on my favorite of all the places, Antarctica. Um, and this is a map of the frozen continent. Um, to orient you guys, um, we live at the top of the map. Uh, New Zealand is down here. South America is in this direction. And I'm pointing out three special stations on the map. Um, so one is the South African base, which is Sanai 4. Um, I unfortunately have never been there myself, but I hear it's quite lovely. Um, the South Pole is right in the center over here and McMurdo is over here. So I've done most of my work in the past at South Pole and McMurdo, and SPIDER is a McMurdo-based experiment, so I'll spend most of my time talking about this station over here. Um, but just as a tangent before I move on, I'll tell you a little story about um, working at the South Pole. So I actually spent a winter there right before moving to South Africa. Durban weather is a lot nicer than the South Pole, actually. <laughs> so, um, before you um, uh, go down to the Antarctic, you need to pass a battery of physical, and, um, physical tests and dental tests, um, go through all these qualification procedures. And for wintering, you also need to pass a psychological exam. So I thought it'd be fun to share some of the questions that they asked me on the exam. It was 500 some some odd multiple choice questions with things like true or false, evil spirits possess me at times, ghosts or spirits can influence people for good or bad, someone has been trying to poison me, <laughs> bad words, sometimes terrible words come into my mind and I cannot get rid of them, uh, my soul sometimes leaves my body, <laughs> someone has it in for me. At one or more times in my life, I felt that someone was making me do things by hypnotizing me. <laughs> I hope I answered all those correctly. <laughs> they did let me go in the end. <laughs> And then, yeah, here are some fascinating multiple choice questions, too. Like, if I could, I would rather exercise by fencing or dancing or wrestling or baseball. I don't know. <laughs> and then, or one of my favorites is which word does not belong with the other two? Cat, near, or sun? I actually don't know what the correct answer is. So <laughs> if anyone knows, please tell me. <laughs> so, <laughs> By the way, fortunately, that's just for wintering, so summer restrictions are much less stringent than that. Um, let me tell you a little bit more about the journey down south. Uh, so the stopover station for McMurdo is Christchurch in New Zealand, which is a really wonderful, beautiful green place to stop over right before you go to the frozen wasteland. And you start off by picking up your clothing from the clothing distribution center. Um, they give you all the parkas and gloves and big boots that you need to survive the cold weather. Um, so this is, I think it was about 15 kilos of clothing that they, they give you these huge orange bags and you dump it out, you try everything on and then you stuff everything back and then, and then you hop on the plane. Um, and so it's military aircraft that services the continent. So this is a C-17 military aircraft that goes from Christchurch to McMurdo. Um, it's a fun ride. You can see that sometimes there's very little cargo inside so you get to stretch out. Um, the military guys really know what they're doing and they have their sleeping bags fully laid out on the floor of the plane. Uh, they really know how to travel in style. And uh, the flight takes about five hours, and you know, halfway through, you, you start to see pack ice form in the water, and it's a really pretty sight to see from the window. Uh, so this is what McMurdo Station looks like. Uh, this is a view from one of the hillsides. And you can see it's actually quite a big station. So during the summertime, the population swells to about 1,000. Um, it's the logistics hub for, this, for the continent. And so it's kind of known as the big city. It really is kind of overwhelming. Um, there are three bars, and there used to be a bowling alley. I think it doesn't exist anymore. But yeah, you, ha you have your choice. Um, and actually, if you want to explore, um, it's actually now on Google Street View. So you can actually take a virtual tour of the station if you would like. It's, it's pretty fun. Um, all right, so now I'm going to talk about SPIDER, which is the reason why we went on this crazy adventure. Uh, this is an experiment that I worked on uh, before coming to South Africa, but I still work on it here. Uh, this was our team. Uh, most of it was based out of Princeton, so that's where this photo was taken. And that was our team at the time with the instrument and then our mascot parked on top of it. Um, you can see that our family has grown to include a bunch of institutions, including UKZN. And so we are trying to keep the spider effort going here in the Southern Hemisphere. 
Um, all right, so SPIDER is a unique telescope in that um, most of the telescopes you've probably seen are on the ground or in satellites, um, and SPIDER is none of the above. So it operates from a stratospheric balloon instead. So let me tell you about how that works. So this is what the setup looks like. You take your telescope, and it looks really small in this picture. You hang it from a launch vehicle, and then the flight train kind of hangs down here. There's a parachute, and then it goes to this helium balloon, um, which then carries the whole thing up into the stratosphere. And this is basically like doing a satellite on the cheap, um, because this costs way less than a satellite. It, costs, uh, it takes less time to do. Um, but you get all of the great observing conditions. So remember I said water vapor is a big problem for us, but if you get above all the clouds on the weather system, then that's awesome. And so that's why we want, that's why we want to tie this thing to the balloon. Um, so how this works in practice is that at the right time of the year, it turns out that the winds blow in a circular pattern around the Antarctic continent. And so if you time everything right and you launch your balloon, then it will blow around in a perfect circle and come back where you started. That's if everything works well. Sometimes it doesn't work that well, but that's the idea. And the typical flight times are a few weeks or so. So launches from McMurdo directly, and then, um, and then you have to go pick up your payload afterwards. So here are some fun factoids about the launch. Um, float altitude is typically 35 kilometers, so a few times the height of commercial aircraft. Um, the balloon volume is a million cubic meters when it's fully inflated at float. So actually, in this picture, only about 1% of it is filled on the ground because it expands as it goes up into the stratosphere. And then the maximum payload weight that this thing can carry is about 3,000 kilos. Um, Spider was quite a heavy girl, and she maxed out most of that. So I'll talk about that later. <clears throat> okay, so that's the idea behind ballooning. And uh, this is another comparison between ballooning. So this is kind of the none of the above category compared to ground-based experiments that you've all seen before and satellites as well. Um, so data quality is limited by how much water vapor or junk there is in the atmosphere. So if you can get to outer space, then there's no more water vapor and you have perfect data quality in that sense, right? Um, balloons are almost perfect because you get above most of the weather systems. And then for ground-based experiments, um, there is all of the atmosphere between you and, um, well, as you try to minimize it by going to high and dry places, but still, there's quite a bit of atmosphere between you and the sky. Um, so this data quality comes at a cost, so that's the next column. You can see that ground-based is the cheapest one to build. Balloons are a little bit more expensive. Satellites are really, really expensive. And they also take a really long time because you have to freeze the technology in advance and then you don't have a lot of room to play around after that. Um, in terms of difficulty to build, satellites are really hard um, because it takes that long. You have one shot to get it to work. Everything has to work perfectly, right? So that's really difficult. Um, balloons are kind of halfway in between um, because you can get the payload back and refurbish it, but then the next time you can fly is one year later. And so you don't want to waste a year um, because you screwed something up. So this is, this is still pretty hard. And then I say easy in quotes because none of this is ever really easy, but if you have access to something on the ground, you can go and uh, tighten a loose screw if you have to. You can't really do that when the balloon is in the air. So, uh, but my favorite comparison column is the fun factor column. So I've actually worked on all three. So so I think I can, um, I feel justified in making these statements, is that, you know, satellites are all right, but you don't really get to touch the hardware. Um, Ground-based experiments are pretty fun. Uh, I've, I've worked on some before, and they're great, but balloons are totally awesome. <laughs> so, so, all right, so this is what our girl looks like on launch day. Um, this is the spider payload attached to the launch vehicle. This is the telescope itself, um, and you can see the flight train coming down here. Um, the launch vehicle is affectionately known as the boss. It's a huge, um, monstrous thing. And then the flight train goes kind of off the screen over here to the left, and then the balloon is way off to the left. Um, so you can see Spider is a very complicated machine. It consists of a lot of subsystems that were built by our institutions all across the globe. Um, so on the outer side, of the, the thing that you see that's the biggest, that's the sun shield. So that prevents the telescope from being baked by the sun while it's up in the air. Um, the telescope itself is this thing that looks like a six shooter. So that's a barrel, essentially. And there are six windows looking out. So those are the entrances or the windows to our telescopes. There are readout electronics mounted down here. There are star cameras so we can figure out where we're pointing. Um, the telemetry package is down here. There is um, communications antennas up here. So our, tel our, our telescope would actually send us a text message every once in a while to dial home and say how it was doing. Um, and then solar panels are back here. So we rely entirely on so solar power and batteries for the duration of the flight. It is completely autonomous, more or less. 
And then this is our principal investigator for scale. So you can see that this is a quite a large instrument, um, and it took a lot of effort to put it together. So I'll take you on a virtual tour of what this thing looks like on the inside. So I'll start with a schematic of this part, so that's the telescope itself. And this is, if you were to cut it in half, this is what you would see inside. So you can see it's kind of a nested structure. Um, and then there, you can see the telescopes kind of peeking out. So they just uh, slot in there um, next to each other. Um, and then this is what it looks like in real life. So if you were to take off the front end of the whole uh, volume, this is what you would see. So these are spiders, six eyes staring at you. And they observe in two different colors. So that's why you see three are black and three are white. Um, and then if you look at the back side, this is what it looks like over here. Um, I won't tell you all the details, but um, this whole thing is cooled with liquid helium. So some of you were enjoying the liquid nitrogen cooled cocktails uh, earlier tonight. And uh, so liquid nitrogen cools everything down to 77 Kelvin. And we cool everything in here with 1,000 liters of liquid helium, which brings everything in here to 4 Kelvin. So everything is cryogenically cooled. Um, there's a lot of complicated plumbing and cryogenic engineering that goes into this. Um, it's a lot of fun to work on. So I spent three years sitting back here putting things together. It's kind of like working on a car, but this is really, this is easier than a car, I think. Um, but you, once again, you can see the six telescopes peeking out, um, and so they just kind of stare into the screen in this particular picture. All right, so this is what one of the telescopes looks like if you pull it out of the full volume. And this is a schematic on the left-hand side. You might think it looks kind of complicated, but actually this is the simplest telescope you could imagine building. So there's just two lenses. There's one here and there's one here. So this is pretty similar to the cheapest um, telescope that you could buy off the shelf uh, for optical purposes. But of course, this is for millimeter uh, wavelength astronomy, and so the optical components look very different from the normal glass you would get from optical telescopes. So rather than glass or plastic for us, or act rather than glass, we use... Um, yeah, opaque plastic for, for our telescope lenses instead. And that actually turns out to be a perfect material for us. Um, and then this is what the telescope looks like in real life when it's fully assembled. You can see that we use a lot of carbon fiber to keep this thing ultra lightweight um, because mass is such a big concern for us. Um, you don't want this thing to not lift off the ground because it's overweight. So, All right, so that's what the telescope looks like. Um, and I'll just say a few words about what lies at the heart of the instrument, which is the camera itself. So this is the camera or the focal plane, and this is what actually detects the light coming in from the Big Bang. Right? So this is what it looks like. Um, each focal plane looks like uh, kind of a foreign object. There are four tiles on there. And each one of these tiles contains a bunch of detectors on board. So if you zoom in on one of these detecting elements, you'll see that it consists of an array of a bunch of antennas that bring in all the light together. And then all of that light is dumped onto these tiny little things over here that's zoomed in on the bottom left. And these are ultra-sensitive super, uh, sensitive, uh, superconducting uh, thermometers, essentially. So these are measuring the heat that the light is dumping on this whole system. And so altogether, this has 512 detecting elements for each focal plane, or a 0 .0005 megapixel camera, you know, very powerful. <laughs> Um, so that's, um, that, that's at the heart of the instrument, but you know, this might not sound like very much, but for microwave astrophysics, this is, um, this is doing pretty good. All right, so that is kind of the virtual tour of the instrument and what lies inside Spider. And I'm going to show you just some glamour shots of what it was like to put this thing together. So um, one, of the w one of the wonderful things about these experiments is that um, you can't buy them off the shelf, right? You can't go to Builder's Warehouse and say, I would like to have a Spider, please, um, and measure the Big Bang with it. No, you have to design and build it all yourself. And that's what's fun about this. And so everything that you see was more or less designed in-house by our postdocs, staff, students. And our students do a lot of the heavy lifting on this. So you can see up, up in the upper left, our students are putting the telescopes together. Um, you know, they, they integrate the telescope with the mounting structure. Um, all of us know how to use milling machines and lathes. And so I love this picture because all three of these um, students are on Spider, and we're just totally dominating the machine shop, which is awesome. And then finally, this is a, this is a picture from one of the close-ups. And you can see one of the students is literally up to her ankles in the experiment, crawling around in there in order to put it together. So it's, it's really a lot of fun. 
So this was um, when, we were developing, when we were developing the, uh, um, the telescope in the States. Um, and then when we shipped it to McMurdo, this is what the balloon station looked like. So we put the whole thing together in this giant high bay. You can see the crane is up here, and these are humans for scale. So this is a really, really tall building. Um, and this was, I think, the first time we brought the instrument out on the deck for outdoor testing. And you can see we were greeted by a penguin to say hi to us, which was pretty Pretty fun. <laughs> All right, so, so that's um, the lifetime of Spider and putting it together. Um, and then it was time to launch the experiment. So that happened on January 1st of 2015. It's a great way to start the new year. And the kitchen staff at the dining facility at the balloon camp actually drew this really cute cartoon for us for New Year's. And if, if, for those of you who can't see, these are two spiders talking to each other, one of them asking, what year is it? And the other one says, I'm pretty sure it's the year of the spider. So uh, we loved our kitchen staff. They were super nice to us. All right, so this is our team waiting for the payload to launch, and this is the balloon being inflated in the background. And I think, uh, yeah, so at this point, can you um, put on the launch video for me? So I'll play a clip of what the launch actually looked like. Okay, so what you see here is the balloon over here. Flight train is stretching down on the ground. This is the parachute, and then this is spider hanging from the launch vehicle, and then they signal to release the balloon, and there it goes. The little things that you might see flapping around in the wind are the fill lines for the, for the balloon, so that's where they dump the helium in. Um, and it's just about to go off the screen, but you can see that the balloon is a little bit pinched at the bottom here. And um, so that is a collar that prevents the helium from flooding the rest of the balloon while it's on the ground. Um, but in just a few seconds, you'll see something drop from up here, and that's the collar being released. And so that will allow the helium to fill the rest of the volume, and then the balloon can expand when it's at float. Um, so when you see stuff falling, um, that's expected, and that's normal. <laughs> All right, so that's the parachute up there. I think in just a few seconds, we'll see the collar drop off. So yeah, the, the launch vehicle right now is trying to catch up to the balloon and position the payload underneath in preparation for launch. So yeah, that's the collar. So that, that's all normal, all expected. And in just a few seconds, it's going to reverse, and then we'll be off. So yeah, there it goes. It is simultaneously exhilarating and terrifying to see this go at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, this is the product of about 10 years of work from a large team. And uh, when this thing went up in the air, everyone was yelling and screaming and crying. And it was, uh, yeah, really, uh, yeah, words can't describe it. It's, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> so, so that's the launch. Um, and like I said, for those of you who saw the pre-talk entertainment, um, we strapped a couple of GoPros to the payload so that we could take some glamour shots from the stratosphere. And so this is a um, picture taken from a GoPro mounted to the front of the spider payload. And this is, you can see it's saying goodbye to the launch vehicle and going up. Um, this is the whole balloon camp as we're ascending uh, uh, up in the air. Um, I love this picture because this is the shadow of the balloon with the spider payload hanging at the bottom. And then finally, this is the view from up there, and it's just absolutely stunning. So the GoPros uh, lasted until the batteries ran out, and then, uh, and then we did science for the rest of the flight. All right, <laughs> so, so that's what the spider flight looked like. Um, and then spider was up in the air for about 16 days. Um, and then this is the flight trajectory that it took around the continent. So it started at McMurdo here, and you can see it kind of did a drunken walk at the beginning and didn't, wasn't really sure what it wanted to do. Here is where the wind picked up, and then it kind of went in this nice arc around the continent. And then it did another drunken walk. And over here, the weather guys told us that the, um, the weather predictions were predicting that the wind would blow spider out over open water. Um, and so they're like, we better cut it down here, because better to have it here. This is really far away and in the middle of nowhere, but better here than here, right? So, so that's where we ended up at the end of the flight. Um, and like I said, there's not a whole lot out here, and there's no um, US bases out there. So we had to enlist the help of our buddies from uh, the British Antarctic Survey. So there are our heroes. They, they had a base um, sort of close by, and they sent out a team to go get the payload. This is what Spider looks like at the landing site. Believe it or not, this is a good landing. So <laughs> um, you don't want to see pictures of the bad landings. <laughs> and so this is one of the British uh, guys who, came, who went to get our stuff. and. Uh, yeah, they're, they're awesome. So I think in return for this, some of our students um, gave them a bunch of bottles of scotch or something. <laughs> so the precious things that these guys re retrieved for us were um, these little bits of hardware. So what you see are the star cameras, but most importantly are these little cylinders, and that contains our data. 
So the trouble is that during the balloon flight, you don't have enough bandwidth to stream everything back in real time. So you have to write everything to disk on board. So you better find those afterwards. Otherwise, all of your observations are for naught. But thankfully, the British guys were able to find those for us. And so the data have been copied back to lots of institutions, including UKZN. And we are happily crunching away and trying to make sense of it right now. So um, this is one of the preliminary images from Spider. I know it doesn't look like much, um, but for somebody who works on telescopes and for, you know, build stuff, um, this is a really heartening confirmation that everything works end to end. And so when you see this, you can relax and, you know, breathe, breathe a sigh of relief that the whole system has worked end to end. Um, so th what you're seeing here, like I said, is not too much to write home about. It's just a bright source in our Milky Way. Um, but it shows that um, we're seeing more or less what we expect. And this is just from a very small set of data. So it's 400 detectors out of 2,000, only an hour of observations out of 16 days. So that's 0.05% of the total volume uh, of data that we have in hand. <clears throat> and the rest of the analysis is in progress right now. So stay tuned because we'll have results hopefully coming out later this year. Um, and you know, this is just a source, but really what we're focusing on is the polarization of the microwave background. So we should have some pretty beautiful images of that. Um, hopefully later this year, knock on wood. All right, so, um, th so that's it for Spider. Um, and before I end the talk, I just wanted to talk about what lies next and some of the other things that are going on. So I'll tell you about the next Antarctic adventure that we are planning right now. Um, unfortunately, some of the pictures don't show up well over here. Um, but this is an experiment that is funded through the South African National Antarctic Program. And we are building this tiny little telescope to um, do something completely different, which is to try to look for the signature of the first stars turning on in the universe. Um, but once again, this is all home built. So this antenna was built by our postdoc, Tabitha Wojtek. This was her PhD project, and she's brought it over here and has improved it for another deployment. Uh, this is a PhD student who's working on the back end electronics. Um, this is when he got the full power chain to work. So you can see he's super stoked about that. Um, so this experiment just went down to Marion Island. Um, and it, I would say it's, it's really hard to see in this picture, but this is South Africa up here. Um, and Marion Island is 2,000 kilometers away in the middle of nowhere. And uh, yeah, it's this tiny little blob. So it's about halfway between Ant uh, Antarctica and South Africa. And the reason why we're sending this experiment there is because it's exceptionally quiet. Um, and so the thing, th this experiment is now observing in the radio rather than microwave. And um, if we were to deploy this here, um, we would see nothing but radio stations um, that you listen to in your car. And so we have to get away from all of that, and so that's why we end up going to these crazy remote locations. Um, so this experiment left at the beginning of April, and just two nights ago, we got this picture sent back from them. So this is the, expo the experiment successfully set up in the field. I think that's the, my PhD student back there looking really cold and miserable. <laughs> but, but the experiment is doing great. So, so the antenna is all set up perfectly. Um, it's hard to see it, but there's waves crashing in the background. Looks very pretty, um, and I hope I can go there someday too. <laughs> so so that's what so that's what lies next. There's a lot of adventures in store for cosmology here in South Africa. Um, so that brings me to the end of my talk. Thank you so much for coming and thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>